I'm bringing in the camshaft too, just because the tolerances were so tight on those bearings. I don't want to mess it up getting it in. Do you do any polishing on the journals for the, the main bearings here? They don't really need it? No, I mean, polish, I mean, if you think about it, polishing them doesn't really help because the bearing is going to be it between, needs, yeah. between there anyway. So you just want to make sure there's no grit and grime and no big burrs or anything like that. Right. On the other one that was all worn out, it looked like there were hot spots on every one of those bearings. Really? Yeah, it's just so fascinating to see how things kind of age and fall yeah, apart. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it ran, but it just, everything was worn out. Nice, clear passageways. So five to six thousandths of an inch were taken off of the head here. Not the head, but the uh, surface where the head bolts up. And what that does is gives us a nice flat surface. There's a beautiful crosshatch here. They said one of these was loose. I don't know which one. Ooh, you know what? I should have brought the valve stem seals. Yeah, if you thought the uh, Volvo was a simple engine, look at the side of this one. Super smooth. There's a water port and like two brackets. I don't see motor mounts on this. I don't even know what this linkage is for. This thing is a cool little simple, simple engine. I wonder if it's for a boat or something or like a non-automotive application. And then look at these pistons on this feller. That is so rad, huh? 7.3 liter power stroke, 1996, dang. One thing I really like about this 240 and the AW70 transmission, the way it's probably adjusted with the kick down and just set up in general, it's working properly, but it'll shift into fourth gear at 38 miles an hour, but then you can ride it down to 29 miles an hour and it'll still stay in fourth if you have very light throttle input which is gonna be really good for fuel economy because I spent a lot of time cruising the village here at just 30 to 35. Baby, it's no mystery. to start the headliner removal on Amy, I wanna talk over a few things. The rear view mirror, I pried it and I hammered it in every direction only to find out that it's meant to come off very simply if you just push forward on it. And as you push on it, it just goes pop and comes right out. It's kind of stuck on there just from the years, but I'm gonna leave it. The rest of the headliner comes out pretty simply. It's got the plastic tab type tuck in ends all the way around. And then these are pretty, pretty bendy. So you can just sort of uh, collapse them in the middle and then pull out one side and then remove it from the other side. Amy's headliner is in much better shape. Saved me another $170 or $200, whatever it is. So I'm gonna use that, put her in this car. There's also foam in the top and the sound deadening paper, which is sagging. So I'm probably gonna remove it and use the fancy type here. That wasn't too bad. Foam inside's really nice. It's not dried out. So compare dry climate headliner, moist climate headliner. Everything's nice. Car has more miles on it. Probably just garage kept too for the majority of those until retirement. I had to document this before it's gone for good, but Amy's seatbelt says February 1969, November 1968. That's the rear seatbelts and it was connected right there. That's too bad. I'll keep it with the car, but I'm sad that it ripped off so easily. Furthermore, I am absolutely 100% glad that I removed those foam pieces. These ones in the rear are clipped, these ones in the middle are clipped, and the sides only are glued. And that's because they are held in with these screws as a majority of uh, their service life. So that's probably why they didn't add extra clips. I am so glad that I got them. I also stand corrected because I thought they were all clipped in. Or I thought they were all glued in. I'm really pleased to find out that they're not. Boy, it's getting crowded and messy in here. Now, so as you can see in this time-lapse, I have a lot of paper to scrape off and I wasn't really planning on removing the paper. I was just going to be putting some glue in the spots that were sagging only to find that 
Well, there's a lot of it sagging. So it seemed like maybe 50% of it was already detached from the roof in various places. And that just was not something that I could tolerate. I only had enough of the aluminum siding for the front and only about half of the rear. So I went over back to my $12 carpet here. And this fella is really paying himself off. This is also a olefin, the same material as the inside rug, but it doesn't have a backing to it as we had mentioned in the carpet building video. And that one looks really good in there. I think the double layer insulation is really going to help a lot and it's uh, gonna be pretty quiet. I said this phrase a lot in carpet building video last episode, but you really gotta wish me luck because I'm nervous for this headliner. I just don't want it to rip. It had a lot of flexibility still coming out of Amy, but getting in here, it might just, you know, be a little too much in some spots. And uh, I mean, at the end of the day, there's not much to lose. What's, what's the worst that'll happen? I didn't spend any more money on this headliner, but I would like it to go back in as nicely as it came out. I thought about building a small fire inside the car so I could get a pot of boiling water and kind of let the steam come up on it. And I wish I had a steamer, but... 95% perfect. And fun, actually. I really was enjoying this. The feeling you get when your thumbs are snapping in the plastic, oh, I don't know what to call it, welt cord or trim or edging into these channels, it's actually quite satisfying. Unfortunately, <laughs> didn't get away scot-free. This corner here decided to have a little rip on it, and I think that I felt it. I felt it right below the handle. It's like, this side feels kind of dry. It might be giving me a trouble later. Wow, that's good English. And then it did, it very much did. Uh, some of the corners do have little flaps that need to be tucked in. Considering that it was not free because it was the cost of the parts car, but boy, did she really give me the value of everything. The advantage I also have here is all the holes are pre-made, so I didn't have to mark out anything specifically. So the way to install this, as you saw on the time-lapse, is you start at the rear, first get all the bows in place, and then you do the rear plastic and then you pull that rearmost bow forward until it's taut. And then you pull the other bow and pull the other bow and pull the, pull the other bow and then pull the other bow. And then you keep pulling each successive bow as you work your way forward. And then you do the front plastic. And the last thing to do is the side plastic because the front plastic may require you to continue pulling these forward. And if you've already done the side, you can't get your finger in there to pull it out or pull it forward. So all that is pretty easy, and it's a lot more fun than using the spike strips on the earlier cars, the 544s and the 122s. Not bad for my first headliner installation ever. I'm quite proud of myself. Well, if there's anything I've learned today, it's that you set your mind to something and you sure can do it. Just don't forget, look for warning signs, take your time. It won't be perfect, but be kind to yourself, I think is the phrase. We're very forgiving of ourselves, I've noticed. Uh, if we could just learn how to do that for other people. Volvo really got it right with this car. This door is so easy to take apart. I've already got the window disconnected. And the reason I'm doing all of this, the little window roller that lives here was too tight and a little too stuck, and it scratched the glass in the middle, going all the way up. The glass has this elevator channel on it, which is attached on two spots with a very simple spring, which is a cool little invention. Here's the spring and the washer goes on the outside of this little channel here. Push this down, you see the spring, or the hook comes out on the other side, and then just maneuver it to latch onto the other arm surface. And that's all there is to it. A little bit of surface rust on this elevator channel, but it's not disintegrated like the ones on Amy are. So I'm going to replace the glass, have to reuse this frame. You can see how much rinsing I did, there's still sand everywhere. And I love that the whole frame comes out. If, in fact, if you wanted to, you could just roll around with frameless doors. Pretty gangsta. So a whole bunch of sand here in the corner, underneath the vent window. Looking down in there, this is what the window sits on, right here, on the back side of that. And one more, right over here. 
And here's the bottom of our frame, largely intact. They've really improved on a lot of the design from the earlier cars with how they made this so easy to remove and service. Now it's time to pull the window and the frame from Amy. We'll have them side by side. I'm gonna compare what the quality is like. Choose the best one to put right back into Ivy. a non-scientific test but before we get to that I want to show you there's a water drain at the bottom of these I have resprayed the uh, the bottom for these guys where the window attaches I also sprayed the one on Amy and that's because I wanted it to get back put together a little bit nicer than it was a, a moment of effort on my part to stop the rust on the uh, on Amy's panel okay the non-scientific test here is which of these two is uh, more pliable and better condition for me to use and I'm going to I don't know let's put them sideways like this and see which one hangs lower. The one closer to you hangs lower. Can you tell which one's more pliable? It's the one on the right. Okay. This is getting out of hand. Up next is the door latch, door handle, and door lock assemblies. Very easy on these cars, just like everything else. In fact, I like this a lot more than the 122s. Made all the way to the trash can from here, but you can't tell, that's fine. And here's why. To remove the locks and to rekey your car, there's a rubber plug in the door. And once that is out, you have an access direct to the screw. That screw comes out, lock pulls forward, Bada boom, there's a little uh, square peg that goes into a square hole. From there, that square hole is the inside of your latch here. That controls the locking mechanism, and this is the entire locking mechanism that comes out with the three screws on the door jamb, and this is the way up. This is the uh, door lock actuator and then this is the door handle. I wouldn't have known this unless I pulled out Amy's, but it's supposed to be spring-loaded. It seems that Ivy's has lost its spring. So I'll be swapping those over. Maybe I can just swap over the internals. Mm. They're both pretty scratched up, but I just I wanna make sure I don't get pitting. If you mix up all your hardware, don't worry, I'm here to tell you just how everything goes. On the back side of the actuator, the part that goes to the inside door handle, that long rod, has the locking clip, kinda like an Omega clip. Each of them gets a washer, but the one that goes to the door handle, inside door handle, it gets two washers. I've noticed that on both cars, so that's what we're gonna do. Only a single washer on the door lock actuator. You may need to adjust your recipe based on yield and uh, how many guests decide to show up. The screws all look like the same length, same head. That's good. Uh, the ones that go into the actuator get the little star washers. The screws that go into the back of the door handle get a star washer and then a regular flat washer. So the star washer is sandwiched. There's a gasket on the other side. This one's pretty deformed and dried out. This one's less deformed and less dried out, so I know what I'll be doing. As far as wear and tear goes, I don't see much that would really go wrong in here. Uh, this rod is the pivot for the entire assembly and it is easy to push out either direction. The spring has one leg here and another long leg one leg here and another long leg over there. This gasket, if you straighten that rod, then you can rotate the gasket sideways and then it'll come out. Well, this side's about finished and gosh, we're only a few hours, a few minutes from sunset. Can't believe it took all day just to figure this out, but the information I learned and the tips and best practices moving to the other three doors should make everything pretty quick. Also, Ooh, she closes so well now. 
before I had a rattle, I cannot believe I saved $170 on new door seals by getting some pretty good ones from the junkyard. Full contact, I mean, even the gap at the end, it's spot on. Everything has just been really good. Always start in the corner. This one's got two corners, so don't stretch it too much. We'll see all the weird bubble in the middle, but it's not that difficult. Speaking of bubbles, the new scraper's in place, and these tend to drag on the windows while they're, you know, full of the oils. I used a silicone, always use a silicone and rubber. Got it this time, but it's, you know, it's grabbing too much. It needs to get like this nice film on it uh, before it starts to slide up and down without any problems. Also, these little rollers here, I just can't get them to be clear enough uh, with the window scraper on, it's putting too much pressure and it's just dragging on these. And that's why I replaced the glasses because it had those scratch marks from that roller not rolling. Got to put a felt pad in just because I'm guessing that that's keeping the glass from getting scratched on this ledge. But felt pads will, uh, there's some that Mitsubishi used and I have extra parts for my Eclipse that I'm going to probably just make sure it's in place there. And hopefully it's screwed in so it doesn't have to, uh, fall off and then threaten to scratch my glass later on. All right, one side finished, seven hours. Wow, a lot learned, let's move on. Well, technically seven hours to do two doors because that one's all put back together as well. Now there's one more thing I wanna mention. The latch, oh, that's, that's a little too tight on that actually. It's kind of springing out, so maybe I'll move it just a millimeter. Um, this is adjusted all the way toward me uh, but I think the whole thing's a little funky because whoever punched that out, I mean, there was drama with, you see the new bolt here, but the door limiter, which was not working before, and that's, as we know, the cause of uh, the trim being destroyed. Thankfully, not too many dents in the door. Woo! Love that. This one here, um, I loosened it, and I see that, you know, it was all the way forward. And now I've put it all the way back, and there's plenty of room. So I'm guessing it is just because the line of the door may be uh, slightly affected by the modification on that speaker hole that was punched out very inappropriately. Ugh. Oh, and one final thing was I also re-glued this panel because it was very loose. And so it came up, and I cleaned the rust and the old glue, which is pretty much a glorified double-sided tape, and then re-sprayed it and... Let's see how well she holds now. One hour and 50 minutes to do the rear. Now let's keep moving and hopefully I can get the other side in in about the same time unless I have to change the glass. Let's see. Well, I stopped about 10.30 p.m. for my dinner break and my back said, nope, no more. So that's it for today. We've got this side is finished. Doors, the seals, the windows, the handles, the mechanisms, everything is installed and lubed up. And that's great. On the passenger side, I have to swap over the window. Fun, but it's going pretty well. I did the same full tear down and full rebuild of everything on one side and everything on another side. And essentially it's been a day <laughs> doing two cars worth of stuff. One of them needs to look nice. The other one does not necessarily. Well, that's that and we'll pick it up tomorrow.